Hello and welcome to this Enclave Peer Exchange uh, panel discussion. Uh, we're here to really discuss the advanced uh, therapies for HCC. As we all know, uh, almost a decade ago, the job was easy. We had one drug and we always worried about sorafenib and the sorafenib cause side effects. Nowadays, we have so many advances in regard to systemic therapy, let alone the advance in regard to the local therapies and the combination of. So today at this Uncle uh, peer exchange panel discussion, we are to really uh, uh, dwell on all those new therapies and also dissect in further details about what do they mean in regard to biology as well as to uh, tolerance for patients. I'm Ghassan Abu Alfa. I'm a medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center in New York City, New York. Uh, joining me on this discussion panel are global experts, Dr. Peter Galle, a professor and director at the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany, Dr. Riyad Salim, professor of radiology, medicine, and surgery, and chief of interventional radiology at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois, and Dr. Amit Singhal, associate professor in medicine, medical director of the Liver Tumor Program at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's get started with our discussions. Amit, I'll start with you. So. Uh, that whole kind of, you know, uh, HCC story is evolving way too fast for us, but to be fair, at the end of the day, there are some patients that we can really take care of and really put this disease behind them and cure them. And uh, tell us a little bit about this perspective about surgery. Who goes for surgery and why? Yeah, I think that, that you're right, that, you know, as the field changes and we have more and more therapies with liver-directed therapies and systemic therapies, we have to remember that really the best prognosis is if you're found early and if you can undergo curative therapies. And the curative therapies remain surgical resection, liver transplantation, and local ablation. So we tend to be very aggressive with curative therapies when possible because it provides the best long-term survival. So for example, anyone who, is, who has um, a lack of cirrhosis or has compensated cirrhosis, we tend to be very aggressive with surgical resection. Anyone who has more advanced liver cirrhosis and has um, tumors within transplant criteria, we tend to be very aggressive in terms of offering them transplant. So Peter, uh, with this introduction, uh, uh, thoughts on any difference in regard to etiology and potential for resection or use of transplant versus resection, Hep B versus Hep C, for example? Well, the situation is certainly changing in that, uh, for example, for hepatitis C patients, we now do have the option to curatively treat, and uh, we can actually do that both before transplant and after transplant. And for the next years, it's uh, to be expected that there will be a dramatic drop in the numbers of patients with hepatitis C virus-driven liver disease. Hep B has been, uh, for the last 10, 15 years, uh, easy to control. So um, what, what that means in the end is um, uh, an impact on very different levels. For example, our um, assessment based on AFP assumptions is probably to be redefined in a situation where infection can be quite well controlled. And the signals which had been in the past obscured by hepatitis are now stronger signals which are tumor driven. So lots of changes, but in um, the essence of your question, is there a difference in etiology with respect to treatment options? No. We do the same thing. We know that there are some differences in outcome. For example, NASH-driven tumors apparently are more benign. They are uh, more slowly growing, but that will not influence the treatment decision as to, for example, resection. Fair, fair. And Adriad, like, you know, from your perspective uh, as an interventional radiologist, uh, uh, of course, we all wish that patients get resection or get transplant and move on. But uh, where kind of like would you, is there a demarcation line between when a patient is in curative intent versus they need your help in regard to some form of fibrillization? Yeah, so, so to follow up a little bit on what Amit was saying, I mean, the, the reality is, you know, when you have early disease, you try to provide curative therapy. The, the, the issue arises that many patients aren't candidates for that for whatever reason, uh, location of tumor, comorbidities, et cetera. And then what you do uh, based on guidelines is you stage migrate to the next best treatment. And so for me as an interventional radiologist, while, while I perform the ablations, you know, many of the patients end up needing some form of embolization. They migrate to the next stage. 
Uh, and so that means there are many patients getting embolization that are actually early stage disease because again, as, as what I mentioned, and I think part of any sort of modern uh, center practicing uh, and managing HCC has to involve that. And the embolotherapies are, are several. You have the bland embolizations, the chemo embolizations, and the, and the yttrium radioembolizations. And so I think you, you really have to understand, you know, where the stage migration concept uh, comes from and when you implement that to really provide sort of a comprehensive treatment plan for the patient. Fair, fair, fair. So, so I, I mean, I get this scenario, and I'm sure you get the same, like, you know, a patient, uh, they get surgery, they got congratulated, tumor is out, and then look at you and say, now what? Yeah. Any adjuvant? Yeah, so I think, I think there's a couple things to keep in mind. As you're, as you're pointing out, I mean, even though resection is curative up front, there's a very high recurrence rate. And so you take a look over the next five years, those patients have a 50 to 70% chance of recurrence. And so this has really highlighted the fact that we really would love to have an adjuvant therapy. And unfortunately, so far, as we'll talk about in the, in, later in this discussion, I mean, right now we've been really limited so far with TKI therapy. And the trials using TKI therapy in terms of an adjuvant setting have been negative. There are now ongoing trials in terms of looking at immunotherapy in an adjuvant setting, and at least I'm, I'm a little bit hopeful that that will be positive. So I think that we will see advancement in this field.